Today's topic is PMV3, a new transaction format being proposed for Bitcoin Cash. Jason, please go ahead when you're ready. It is a version three transaction format proposal, which would allow us to use the existing smart contracting features of Bitcoin Cash to do a lot of the things you can already do on systems like Ethereum and other global state networks. So decentralized finance applications. So this would allow us to build token applications, things that you do, uh, you know, ICOs for and stuff. This allows us to build prediction markets and other information markets, binary contracts and other synthetic assets that represent real world assets on chain, decentralized exchanges. As far as we know, anything that's being built on any other cryptocurrency platform should be possible in Bitcoin Cash with this. So it's, that's certainly quite a big claim and it's an exciting one. I think one of the reasons I've spent so much time trying to dig into PMV3 is just to establish whether you're actually right about that or not. There's also a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of the way one thinks about what smart contracts would look like in PMV3. It's not sort of a replica of the Ethereum virtual machine, for example. I'm very excited about all these potential applications. At the same time, it's really hard to try and imagine what they would look like using PMV3. So having concrete examples is great and cash tokens is brilliant in that way. I'm looking forward to seeing some more detail on that. Thank you. Yeah. And Richard's review has actually been really, really helpful already. And there's been some improvements to the spec from it. And as Richard was saying, it's quite a different paradigm actually than the global state network. So Ethereum and several other cryptocurrencies, their transactions can actually interfere with each other. And that causes some scaling issues. And what is quite different about the Bitcoin Cash strategy in general is that transactions are atomic. They don't interfere with each other other than the double spending resolution. And this contracting ability does not interfere with that scaling ability. In one sense, we can build all the things that you would be able to build on a global state system, so far as we know, but the scaling advantages of that isolation are not given up. From a developer's perspective, it is a little bit harder as a mental model to develop an application that scales like this because each contract holds its own state. And that makes it quite a bit more mentally taxing to develop an application. But the benefit, of course, is that it scales very well. Like you mentioned, the mental model for the developer is quite a bit more difficult. What kind of people will be the ones that are going to be building on top of this if it's implemented? Is it going to be node developers or regular JavaScript developers? What's like the skill level where you have to be to, to really build something on top of this? It is a little hard to envision early on. I imagine it's a crowd that is not yet super visible, but a lot of the people that are already building applications on networks like Ethereum, I imagine will want to take a look at a more scalable option for certain types of applications that already exist. It's a lot like when you're developing for a company in normal internet world, it's much easier to build a monolithic application. It's quite a bit more complicated to build one that scales very well and scales horizontally globally and stuff. Yeah, if I can add to that, for Ethereum, for example, they design Solidity to be based off of JavaScript in order to make it easier for programmers to get in. I think this was a huge, huge, huge mistake. If you get some strange thing and your Facebook application blows up, you just reload the browser. But instead, what we're really seeing in these systems, you know, you got three lines of code in, in the DAO. And if this line was up here versus here, the DAO would not have exploded. It's gonna require a different level of disciplined coder to do these kind of things. And specifically with what's being introduced in PMV3, the complexity of the code, the expressibility of what can be done is exploding. Now we're all, if you're a Bitcoin Cash developer, you're used to programming mostly in kind of like the assembly language of Bitcoin. This kind of puts that out of the realm of being reasonable. You know, Jason's examples are in Cash Script, right? Which is a language that compiles down into the assembly language. We're now going to have to use languages that are extremely safe, very type safe, require and impose a correct by construction discipline rather than what's been allowed to run on Ethereum and other blockchains. That's a huge shift. And it's also going to make, I believe, these smart contracts on BCH far more reliable and resilient to those kind of attacks. There are a few different ways we could get uh, this expanded functionality. One thing that I think is very cool about the strategy in PMV3 is the existing virtual machine is actually already very powerful. And it's sort of a happenstance of how transactions are packaged up that makes it not currently capable of looking backwards in the validation. Um, so we can, we can validate the current transaction and we can validate from the future forward, but validating backwards is not possible just because of kind of a packaging issue. With PMV3, we can get quite a bit of functionality just by adding a hash. 
and then the existing virtual machine works quite well. So Smart BCH is a BCH sidechain, which runs decentralized applications that are designed for the Ethereum virtual machine. Smart BCH alone requires a trusted peg between the side chain and the BCH main chain. But with PMV3, that smart BCH peg could actually be designed to rely on a more secure BCH contract rather than the trusted peg. So they are not alternatives, they are very complementary. Smart BCH is really designed for existing applications that have, that have already been designed for that Ethereum model. So Solidity and Mitra are both virtual machine proposals for sort of wholesale replacing the existing underlying virtual machine in Bitcoin Cash. Or in the case of Solidity, that one was proposed almost six years ago, I think now. And development is sort of ongoing. And that gives you a sense of their alternatives, but a little bit further out, they require a lot more research before we would want to swap something out like that. The existing virtual machine is a well-known quantity. It's well understood and well tested. So we're, we're not very concerned with making it slightly more powerful in certain ways. Group tokens is a hard-coded token proposal. It would allow us to do some of these more advanced contracts. So there are certain parts of it that are an alternative to PMP3. But then, of course, things where you're having contracts that interoperate, where you have a contract that reads another contract and such, a lot of those still would require something like PMP3. A lot of what can be done with group can also be done in contracts alone with PMV3, but group could make some of them more efficient. So that's nice. I should note there's one other high level alternative we could consider, which isn't really being proposed, but if we had introspection opcodes that allowed a transaction to look into details about its parent transaction, that would also solve what we are trying to solve with this PMV3 stuff. However, that would be quite a bit worse for scaling. PMV3, we're able to simply add a hash to, to certain transactions, and then those transactions pay their own cost. They wouldn't increase the general validation cost of the network, but instead they'd be 32 bytes more expensive themselves, which properly incorporates the cost of the network of doing the hash. So my goal here in this is looking at how Bitcoin Cash, as we have been using it for a while, is affected by the changes. If there's any negative consequences for scaling, if the complexity is being increased unreasonably and other such things. So I've been looking at that from a lot of different angles uh, with Jason, and I think we're very happy about how it extends the vision of the original Bitcoin in that it allows you to do more with the tools you already have. So it's basically removing obstacles instead of adding features. And that's, in my view, the best way of looking at it. It's making a small change that removes some obstacles that allows us to do more. And from that point of view, I think this is the most sane way to go for the coin. So that's, that's my point of view here. Yeah, I'll just echo Tom's statements. It's really impressive what Jason has been able to eke out of a non-Turing complete computation engine. Although I tell you what, our team is still getting our heads around it. We still can't follow through all the examples, but we're working on it. What PMV3 allows is a couple additional fields in the transaction. The most important one is the detached proofs. In a version one or version two transaction, if you're trying to inspect some element of a parent input in that transaction, what you do is in your proof information, you have to push the contents of the parent transaction and then pick it apart sort of to demonstrate what's going on. That becomes an issue because you'll have to include the parent transaction but the parent transaction actually includes its grandparent transaction, et cetera. Um, so if, you if you're trying to inspect backwards, every time you step forward again, your transaction gets that much bigger and it becomes completely unreasonable after even just a few transactions. What we do in PMV3 is instead of having to include the grandparent transaction, the grandparent transaction could optionally have chosen to use a detached proof and so instead of including its own proof information here, it hashes all of that. So you can see the red block is just a hash now. And the hash of that is the contents of all this stuff. But by hashing it, now the parent transaction is actually a fixed size. Each time we step forward in this program, looking backwards requires just a fixed 32 bytes instead of an exponentially growing amount of information. If you're curious more about the details, I encourage you to check out this blog post where I step through what is a contract and what's a covenant and some of the other details. 
even get into some of the applications. Kind of the simplest one is on-chain token sales. We can build a covenant that sells its own tokens, <laughs> that uh, conducts its own IPO. And we can even do interesting things like conduct continuous liquidity events, like continuous buyouts, which could be very cool. So there's that. The transferable synthetic assets, you can hedge in the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem with an adequate Oracle, which might be provided by a prediction market. You can hedge pretty much anything in the world and you can replicate any kind of portfolio just in the Bitcoin Cash world using a mix of derivatives. <laughs> What's cool is with PMB3 is we can make those synthetic assets transferable. So the things that are already happening with any hedge and detoken right now, we can make those transferable from different end users so that they become a lot more like synthetic assets already existing in the real world right now. Decentralized exchanges, we can build exchanges that trade in those synthetic assets, and we can build exchanges that trade in other tokens that are built on the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem. What's cool about that is that these markets could enable borderless global uncapped investment in any stock, commodity, currency, or other asset, because by nature, they are on the internet. They are not in a single country or they're not in a single institution. And then prediction markets, betting on the outcomes of events, but more interestingly, combinatorial prediction markets is what they're called, where you bet on sort of a grid. Imagine there are four different boxes. On one side is whether or not PMV3 happens. And on the top is whether or not the price of Bitcoin cash is over 10,000 in a year. People can bet on individually each of those boxes. And by looking at the sum total percentages in each of them, you get a good sense of how variable X affects variable Y. If it's implemented and the price is over 10,000 is, is like 10% 10 higher chance, we then can assume that the market believes that PMV3 has a 10% chance of increasing the price beyond 10,000 within a year. That's a very simple example, but you can get much more complex. You can have scalar values actually. So it's not just yes or no values. The market can actually indicate to you exactly how much it thinks it will increase or decrease the price in that time frame, And there might be other time frames that are also measured. So information markets like prediction markets probably will be one of the most important creations in the coming hundred years. And they've been not very possible before we've had as much computing power as we have, and also consensus technology as we currently have. The technology and our knowledge of the topic have gotten to a point where I think in the next 10, 15 years, I expect prediction markets will become a much bigger part of our world. Health and medicine, scientific theory and discovery, environmental protection, management of public corporations, marketing and consumer protection, insurance and disaster prevention, software security, news media, transparency, empowering whistleblowers, breaking propaganda and reducing violence. They have a lot of promise. I think Bitcoin Cash should be particularly interested in making sure prediction markets work on Bitcoin Cash. If the dollar was crowned as the world's reserve currency for its use in basically in global trade and oil, I think there's a good case to be made that its successor will be crowned for its use as a reserve asset in information markets. And that is what we are competing over right now. Bitcoin Cash is particularly well suited for it between low network costs and good scalability, reasonably good privacy, and then also deflationary. I think is quite important for a well-functioning prediction market. I'm interested to know from Jason like, what you think of other prediction markets not exploding um, that we've seen on, for example, Ethereum. Is that because of the transaction fees? Probably. I imagine prediction markets are going to take a while to get big in the same sort of curve as internet usage and computer usage, really. The places where prediction markets get really interesting is where they start to have an effect on the social fabric of the world. Right now, people go to the news if they want to understand some current events. In the next 20 years, I'd be very surprised, actually, if, if people didn't look to prediction markets for a much better understanding of where reality actually stands, where news can be quite biased, numbers and markets are not going to lie about actual probabilities. So where the news can actually make a mountain out of a molehill and vice versa, they can totally cover something up that is important. Prediction markets, I think, will help to allow people who are not necessarily experts in something. If you're not, you're not an expert in quantum anything, but if the news says again that we finally got a quantum computer, you can immediately fact check the news by checking, have the prediction markets actually resolved that this is 
the quantum computer that breaks all of traditional cryptography. And you'll find, you know, no. <laughs> Yet again, it's no. Um, <laughs> and the news is just trying to get you to watch again. Things like that are going to, I think, very fundamentally change where people consume their information. And those things take time. They take generations. In the next 10 or 15 years, we might have a big growth in prediction markets. But 100 years from now, prediction markets are going to be, I think, one of the world's core information sources and they'll be very good at it. So a lot of things where uncertainty destroys a lot of value in the world today, I think prediction markets can save a lot. There are a lot of disasters that could be averted if people knew what information to look at. If an expert believes something that the world should know more about, they can help to make a, a new market that surrounds that belief properly or highlight a current one, and they can actually become fabulously wealthy if they know something that the world doesn't and they help the world to understand it. Are there any other technical reasons why you think the prediction markets and also the other use cases that you outlined will work better on Bitcoin Cash with PMV3 rather than something like Ethereum? Yes. So, and I say specifically a good example, actually, of where the limitations of Ethereum have hindered the uptake of existing prediction markets. Several of the existing prediction markets have actually had to change their algorithms to make them reasonable on Ethereum. Now, side chains, so rollups in Ethereum, as running Ethereum in a side chain would allow some of that scalability stuff to come back. So I wouldn't say that prediction markets are impossible on Ethereum. With rollups, the sky is the limit there in some ways. However, there's still a lot of work to be done. And a lot of the existing prediction markets have spent a lot of their development work in the past few years making it work on the Ethereum base layer. And in a lot of ways, they're going to have to undo the work that they've done there. They've simplified their market scoring rules. Uh, a couple of them don't even really use a market scoring rule anymore. They just use kind of a bidding system. There are market scoring rules, which we know are better for prediction markets, which are simply not implementable on Ethereum unless you do it on a layer two. Part of the reason some of these prediction markets have had so much trouble there is because they have been spinning their wheels on that implementation issue. <laughs> Even just recently, there have been times when it costs several hundred dollars in, in 2020 US dollars to create an account or, or so on these prediction markets. And then, you know, if you have to pay $50 a trade, you are pricing out a lot of your potential market and therefore potential profits. Then you have your chicken and egg problem of why would experts bother to go and set up on this market if they're just going to share their knowledge, but make five bucks on it. And if they pay it all on transaction fees. So there's all sorts of stuff like that, where I think the flywheel has not really been spun. And in part, just because there's a lot of implementation issues that have to be worked through. In a lot of ways, those implementation issues, the road is now clear. However, they still have a long way to go. So I think it's actually going to be very competitive, probably, for new prediction market efforts to begin on Bitcoin Cash. They're not very far behind what exists already on Ethereum. And do you think that the same principles translate to the other use cases as well? Or are these specific to prediction markets? Specifically, in the case of transferable synthetic assets, you can make a synthetic asset with any price feed. Um, the issue is how much you trust the price feed. And if you look at how that market has developed, the Ethereum world is not far past even the current BCH world. Right now, any hedge and D token, the price feed is trusted, semi-trusted at least. And that is basically the state of the ecosystem also in Ethereum. The design is a little bit more advanced in some places, the, the visual UI design, but you know, under the covers, they're practically equivalent right now. So the primary difference between the current BCH world there and Ethereum is that those synthetic assets are transferable in Ethereum right now, but it's also not really much more developed. The most advanced oracles, so far as I'm aware actually right now, are basically multi-sig contracts. If four different companies lie, then the, the oracle still falls through, right? So there has been a lot of work done in Ethereum, but I would not say that Bitcoin Cash is far behind, even if we're starting from scratch. This is a consensus change, so all full nodes will have to update. This is a little bit larger of a change for the ecosystem than for example, like a new op code, because with a new op code, all you need to do is have the nodes update. And most wallets and validating software, most SPV wallets and indexers, um, things like that can usually ignore them. In this case, the footprint of what is going to have to be updated is quite a bit larger. I would call it a moderate where all indexing software, this is stuff like Blockbook and Bitcore, things that are the server side software that provide APIs 
for end wallets. That stuff will need to be updated. And then SPV wallets, so Electron Cash, Poket, things that are themselves validating the actual state of the chain in some ways, because they also are parsing and validating transactions. Those pieces of software will also need to be updated. So any software which parses transactions will have to be updated. Interestingly enough, most wallets that most users are using don't parse transactions. Just to give you an equivalence, it's very, very similar to the DAA change, the difficulty algorithm adjustment change. The footprint of software that will need to be updated is very, very similar to that, as opposed to, I'd say the most difficult ecosystem change, I would call high, (laughs) a high change would be wallet software and signing software itself needs to be updated because of how you're changing the signatures. And that, that's only happened once in Bitcoin Cash. That was the fork change that was applied the BIP143 signature stuff in 2017. But this is quite a bit less breaking than that, but still quite a bit more than opcodes. So right in the middle of ecosystem difficulty, pretty much all consensus validating software will need to be updated to support this version three transaction format. Fortunately, it's very similar to the current transaction format. In a lot of cases, it's probably just going to be copy and paste and then copy the section twice more for the two additional fields that are at the end, but it still requires an update. Fortunately, it doesn't necessarily require an update for wallets themselves, or especially for hardware wallets, for the hardware devices themselves. There will be no firmware update there. It will be only the server side API that is pre-parsing the transaction before it comes down. That stuff will need to be updated. There is a review, if anybody's curious, in the Bitcoin Cash Research Forum, where I went through and broke apart a lot of the existing wallets, the BitPay wallet, Bitcoin.com, Edge, Jax, Exodus, Trezor, Ledger. Those should only require updates on the company's servers. They shouldn't require the user to update their wallet because the company's server parses the transaction and sends it down either as a JSON or as a gRPC call. The user's wallet just asks the server for what are its UTXOs and and the signing doesn't change and version one and version two transactions will continue to be possible and interchangeable. You'll be able to send money in a version three transaction and that wallet doesn't even have to understand the version three transaction. They just have to know what the UTXO is and they get it from the server and they'll be able to send that money in a version one or version two transaction. So from the user's wallet perspective, they won't have to know anything about it. It's just that the back end that supports those wallets will have to be updated to the latest node version, obviously, like they have to be updated after every change. But then also if they have any indexing software that's doing parsing separately from the full nodes, that will also have to be updated. It's not an easy change, definitely not an easy change, but it's not insurmountable. A little bit of clarification. And also I'm curious what Jason thinks about this. The scope of what Jason is talking about is these are the changes that are necessary for the ecosystem in order to stay on the chain and still operate, right? For doing what you're doing today. But I don't believe that is sufficient as far as changes for being able to participate and do all the cool things that PMV3 is going to do. Like if I want to participate in this prediction market, my wallets are going to have to be really advanced. What have you thought as far as how this is going to evolve? And like, like right now, few wallets even support the simple complexity of the SLP uh, tokens. Yes. So in order to use this stuff, wallets will have to be updated to use it. And it's actually hard to even thoroughly envision what the whole ecosystem will look like, because we're talking about quite a paradigm shift in what's possible. I've spent several months now trying to figure out what that might look like, or actually a couple of years now. But yes, wallets, in order for wallets to participate in this stuff, they will also need to be updated. Those are the places where the Ethereum ecosystem is quite well developed already, and where we've got some catching up to do. A lot of our existing libraries have basically fixed transaction construction methods that are you know hard coding exactly what the contract should look like and that's still fairly common across the cryptocurrency ecosystem so i imagine we're going to get kind of the first wave of wallets that have generalized transaction construction support that exists now in the liboth library that i'm working on and cash script roscoe's stuff also gives you that ability so we are getting there but there's definitely a lot of work to get where wallets can support adding a new authentication scheme even if the developers of the wallet aren't terribly familiar with how various on-chain applications work you want users to be able to import an authentication scheme that they trust and want to use and be able to communicate with separate networks there 
a lot of these networks are going to be separate peer-to-peer networks that are one-to-one pegged with BCH, where they happen on a side chain, they scale independently, but then their value transfers settle back to the Bitcoin cash chain. That'll probably be the most common way that the fanciest prediction market stuff will probably happen. There's going to be a lot of development to do for wallets to provide those APIs and things provide those nice user interfaces for synthetic assets and prediction markets and stuff. There's a huge field of new development and UI work to do there. But at least in the near term, the changes aren't immediately required of the wallets themselves. It's just if those wallets want to provide those new features to users. The whole idea of a wallet as we've been using it in Bitcoin for a couple of years is extremely limited. We just look at it as money. And that makes total sense because we still have a floppy disk for saving. People understand it. But when we consider the fact that the only front end for the entire Bitcoin Cash concept is what we now call a wallet, then we have to realize it's going to have to do a lot more than just be a wallet. You're going to have to have an entire payment solution. You're going to have to have all of these items in there And it probably is going to be several years of development and not just the new features that we add there, because just adding new features means that only developers are going to use them. It's going to be the user interface that is going to be the hard part to make. It's going to be the interesting part where we turn it into a product and the product is going to be ready for end users. That is going to be the actual test of when Bitcoin Cash is going to be seen as serious because that's going to be when we start seeing a lot of people seeing the value outside of just, you know, the developers and then the, the experts. Yeah, there's a lot of development to be done there. I don't know if wallets will be an all-inclusive new category of applications. That's kind of the way the wallet ecosystem has developed so far in Ethereum and elsewhere. But it's also possible that we'll continue seeing the current crop of wallets continue being just a money thing. And that we get a new crop of applications that are your decentralized brokerage thing. So it's like almost like your brokerage app. Um, right now, a lot of people use a different app for their banking stuff, different from stock brokerages. There might be a wallet that is focused on those synthetic assets. There might be an app that's focused just on prediction markets. And then there will probably be wallets that have plugin systems that let you install the prediction market app that is developed by somebody else to, to work in the plugin. So I'll be curious to see how that part of the ecosystem actually develops. If they will be separate apps, kind of like the world currently works, or if these wallets will build plugin systems and try to extend that way. I think to make such a thing like that possible, we're going to have to go through the similar kind of evolution that Ethereum did with their ERC-20 for fungible token standard. Right? How do you call it and interact with these? You got 721 for non-fungible. You got 1155, so you can combine them all together and make them discoverable. We're going to have to do something like that, which is also kind of interesting because you know some developers are frustrated that BCH isn't moving fast enough. How am I going to innovate and get a first mover advantage on Bitcoin Cash because it's so slow to adopt? And it's like, you know, when this thing goes live, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that brings up a good point. Developers right now, in order to make something happen on Bitcoin Cash, need a proposal that will happen during one of these scheduled upgrades. Once this is out, most developers will not need to have a network proposal to have a new token standard. They'll just design it in the contract language that is already supported in Bitcoin Cash. So in a lot of ways, this brings a lot of protocol development work. It makes it part of what is possible to do in user space. So our speed of development hopefully will be quite a bit faster and will be driven more on the wallet side, definitely, than it is currently where it's driven on the what we can add to nodes and get everybody to agree on and deploy at the same time and all of that stuff. I've got a couple of questions from the YouTube chat that I think are relevant to this section from Mr. Tester01. He's asking, are there any projects that PMV3 will make obsolete? Um, and, and maybe they mean within the Bitcoin Cash e- ecosystem, but also maybe not, not sure. I wouldn't drive a stake in anything 
right now. No, I, I don't think so. I, I can see some upside outside of PMV3. Um, so Smart BCH allows us to run Ethereum stuff on a side chain of, of Bitcoin Cash. That's a perfectly viable decentralized application of its own. Other VM proposals are certainly good to continue working on academically. There might be much better ways of doing this than Satoshi designed in the first version. We're just kind of extending the thing that Satoshi already designed to work for this other stuff. Group tokens, there are a few use cases where you could cut quite a few bytes from certain types of transactions if we did some sort of hard-coded solution like that. There are lots of opcode things that are still useful even with this. This will allow us to build pretty much anything we want. The limit is our ability as engineers to figure out how to make it happen. There are certain areas of development that are currently not possible at all and clearly not possible. But with this, it's going to be a lot harder to say that like, yeah, that's not possible on Bitcoin Cash. It's much more likely that, no, I haven't figured out how to do that on Bitcoin Cash yet. I've not yet found something that I can't figure out how to do on Bitcoin Cash. It is quite powerful already. But yeah, so I wouldn't say there's any proposals that I know of that this kills, <laughs> that this totally deprecates. To the contrary, there are projects that PMV3 will supercharge. Any hedge comes to mind and SLP comes to mind. So for example, an upgrade to the SLP protocol could allow minor enforced tokens. So I don't think SLP will become obsolete. I think SLP will evolve to leverage PMV3 and then be one of the token standards or implementations out there. And that's really exciting for SLP, for example. I see it as a supercharging technology rather than something that's going to obsolete other projects. And making SLP work on those decentralized exchanges, for example. SLP needs to be contract validatable if you want the decentralized exchange to be able to confirm that you're selling an SLP token. So things like that. I definitely imagine that SLP will evolve and we can find ways of migrating in a backwards compatible way. So there's some clever ideas of like dual validating where we can have an intermediate version which works with existing SLP wallets, but also starts to work on the contract validatable. A lot of the existing stuff, we can definitely retrofit and upgrade to make work better with these decentralized things. From emergent reasons, given a shared state like a prediction market, atomicity won't be a problem because of the fundamental BCH UTXO design, but will there be competition for redemption of some UTXOs? Yes, if you design your application. It's such that it's vulnerable to that issue. It is definitely possible to design your application where it is not. So in some cases, you'll be able to sort of shard the application itself across multiple UTXOs. The cash token demo is an example of that. The cash token demo allows you to mint a new token and then send that UTXO to someone and they can send it around and they can actually send it to a multi-sig wallet and send back to another one, whatever. And eventually you can bring it back to the contract and you can redeem it with the contract to get your money back. And that's not a terribly useful application, but it demonstrates all the primitives you need for really important things like depositing money to a prediction market and doing the prediction market stuff and withdrawing your earnings or whatever. But the cash token demo is a good example of that sharding capability because the top level covenant has information about all the tokens and we mint tokens and then people can actually move those UTXOs around independently of the top level covenant. And eventually they turn them back in each of those have their own history and their own competition over the UTXO for that piece. But only when you turn it back in is there competition over the top level UTXO. This makes it a little more complicated for developers to figure out like how the scaling actually works. But it's a problem that the developers have to figure out rather than a scaling problem for the network itself. We pick to the side of the trade-off where the network stays stable and instead developers have to work a little harder. Could you elaborate on just... What actually we mean by competition for redemption oh, of the UTXOs? Sorry, yes. There's a public contract somewhere where there's a pot of money on the chain, which is the prediction market fund. And you can send money to that address and you get that money in the prediction market. And then you can withdraw. The contention issue we're talking about is there's that pot of money that exists on the network. And there might be multiple people in the world at any moment in time who want to do something with that UTXO. So in the case of the cash tokens demo, there's contention over if I want to mint at the same time as somebody wants to redeem, both of us might send a transaction. In the case of the cash token demo, that's a good example of where the contention isn't actually an issue because I'll mint my token. And if you deposited a couple seconds before I wanted to mint, whatever, I'll just build on top of your unconfirmed transaction because why not? It doesn't affect either of us. The contention isn't something where we're going to try to go get a, a miner to undo his transaction so I can put mine in first. And that's a contract design thing. You want to design your contracts 
to where contention doesn't benefit any of the players in the current block. And it's actually not too difficult to design a contract where all of the contention in this block applies in the next block so that as long as everybody gets their transaction in now before the next block, we all get the same price. The virtual machine language is not a great language to design very fancy stuff. In, and neither is the Ethereum virtual machine. You don't want to write your code for a lot of stuff in these blockchain consensus algorithm virtual machines. You want to just write it in like Rust or C++ or whatever. And you run it as a separate peer-to-peer -peer network. And then you create the peg where you can deposit and withdraw from that network, you create that in the virtual machine language. It's much, much easier to do it that way. It is tractable, but it is a very good question because it's something the developers have to think about. You can't get around thinking about it. Here's one from imaginary username. Have you evaluated DOS, so I assume denial of service possibilities of transactions consuming disproportionately high amounts of resources compared to their size? I assume he means computational resources. Yes. And actually the best place to look for a summary on that is the virtual machine limits chip, which is totally unrelated to this, but I just released it a couple of weeks ago. I dug into that very deeply and confirmed that the primary concern for resource usage is signature validation and hashing. Practically everything else is not even like a rounding error. And the cliff notes is that it's just not expensive anyways. An attack which tries to exhaust resources in hashing or signature validation. If you were running a node, you probably wouldn't even notice the attack happening. It would just look like somebody's filling up the blocks. Somebody is paying to fill the blocks, which um, is you know, possible with op return. Essentially, the only thing that really matters when you're validating a lot of transactions is disk IO because the waiting for the data coming from disk is a million times more than the actual CPU doing the work. One clarification, which things have to be updated for this transaction format to work on the network? And then which other things don't have to be updated to keep functioning, but do have to be updated to use the features? Could you just give us a quick overview of that again? Anything that parses transactions will have to be updated. Usually that's going to be the backend indexer that supports a lot of wallets. What doesn't need to be updated is wallet signing code and usually wallets if the wallets are asking for UTXOs in a pre-parsed way. It'll depend specifically on the piece of software, but a good way to check is, does this piece of software parse transactions? And the reason why it's only software that parses transactions is that all PM33 does is rearrange the contents of a transaction. And that's why it's called a transaction format. But every transaction in PMV3 still has inputs, outputs, you know, the same semantics. And that's what's so brilliant about PMV3 is that it's literally just a rearranging of fields in this format. And then it enables things like inductive proofs. Conductive proofs are not a first-class component of PMV3. They're something that you can do in user land if your transactions are arranged in this way. From imaginary username again, if an indexing backend does not plan to support version three transactions, can they not upgrade? Are there indexes that don't actually pass raw transactions that would sort of bolt onto a full node and actually receive the transaction data in a non-raw form? There definitely are. I think the ones that are, though, are asking over the RPC interfaces generally. So they're either asking for a raw format or they're asking over the RPC interfaces. And in, in the RPC interface case, as long as the node is updated so it doesn't break that API, indexers could just ignore the new fields, obviously. Um, exactly. Be, yeah. yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about any efforts you've made so far reaching out to stakeholders or if you've received any public support or if you've not, what your plans are to reach out to those stakeholders? We want to make sure the spec is really, really right before we try to get people to commit to things. A lot of those stakeholders are excited about it, but we're going to leave it at there are no public commitments yet. There are a couple of details actually that the reviewers on this call have helped to identify that we want to improve. But I imagine in the next month or so, we should have everything really settled. And then that includes a lot of the end use cases. We've spent a lot of time now in the past six months, actually, thinking about what we can do downstream with it and making the software libraries work with this stuff. And so we're just uh, making sure that all of those learnings have made their way into the spec. But yes, hopefully in the next month or so, we should be in a place where we're ready for people to sign on and provide endorsements and things. From Eleanor Blanc, she hears a lot of support for this new 
transaction format. Has there been any contention that you've seen? Well, it's quite nice that it's just a format change in that all of the contention so far, there's been a little bit of contention over the details of how I proposed the original version, specifically some of the number formatting stuff. We need to make numbers work in the virtual machine, but all of that contention is represented on this call pretty much <laughs> as far as anybody who's come to me and talked about it. That's the part actually we're still figuring out. It's really like some details that aren't going to be terribly important to most of the people listening on this call, but we want to get really right how we encode numbers or how we choose to solve the number encoding incompatibility. The only contention so far that I know of is actually that. I imagine we're actually going to just separate out PMV3 from another, from a, the, the number formatting part of the proposal, and we will discuss that separately. But those are application details. It's not the high level. We should allow a hash of unlocking bytecode. So that's good. It's, it's quite nice that it's, as far as I know, non-contentious.